New Song Church and Ministries is a place where the races worship and minister together. It's a place where the young and the old stand in unity, where the heart of the Father prevails. It's a place of feeding the hungry and homeless, healing the broken hearts, and sending to the various nations and tribes of the world. If you can help us to sustain all these ministries, and if you're benefiting from these free online videos, please consider a gift, either online or by check. Here's the information. Touch me Jesus, <laughs> that's a thought. We need to know you. We need to know you a lot better than we do. And so, Lord, in, in this word today, come introduce us to just another part of you that we need to know because you are who you are, because you are our life, there, isn't, there just isn't any life outside of you. So come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. You know, I hadn't intended to give this little bit of a word today, but the Lord spoke to me very clearly yesterday, so I'm going to put it out there. This is, this, this is the mini-sermon before the sermon. <laughs> I have for a long time been frustrated with, with the shrill tone of the body of Christ in our country. You know what I'm saying? Harsh, angry, judgmental. A lot of that comes because we have thought of ourselves as a Christian nation. And somehow, a whole lot of us, over the years, have blended our country with our faith. Until our freedom in the United States and our, uh, the idea that we're a Christian nation has somehow become almost part of our Christian statement of faith. And it's blurred our loyalties, twisted our perceptions. And what so many of us are seeing right now is that we're losing what we thought our country was. And we're hurt. And we're angry and we want to fight back. Does that make sense? And so what comes out of us is anything but love. The anger of a man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. That's the scripture. And when that anger comes out of us, it actually makes things worse. And what I'm calling for right now is a purification this pressure that we're sensing coming, that's been building up on us and our country, I believe, if, if we will receive it this way, it's a pressure of purification. Because so many of us have really made an idolatry out of the United States. Over the years, have you noticed, I will not put an American flag in the temple of the Lord. I will not. Because I love my country, but I don't worship it. I serve a king who stands higher than that. My nation is not the United States. My nation is the body of Christ. That's 1 Peter 2. Go read it. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, to declare the excellencies of the Lord. And my people, my nation, transcends every tribe, tongue, and nation on this earth. And I will not confuse those loyalties. So this is a time, people, to get our loyalties purified. And to understand that we are foreigners in this land. And we will be until Jesus takes us home. We are not a part of this world system. We've been adopted into a kingdom. Jesus is our king. Jesus is our government. And he doesn't run a democracy. 
he really thinks he's God. <laughs> okay, so that's the free sermon. And I think if we can get that straight and get our loyalties straightened out, then some love can begin to come out of our mouths. And it doesn't mean we ignore the sin that's going on. And it doesn't mean that some of us aren't called to be involved in politics. Who wants to live under an unrighteous government? Some of us are called to be there. Be there. Be there, but keep your loyalties straight. And keep the love coming from your heart. I mean, (laughs) Joseph in Scripture didn't win his place with Pharaoh by telling Pharaoh what a turd he was. Okay. (laughs) Well, here's the second sermon. (laughs) Bring it on, Lord. (laughs) Bring it on. You know, it's funny how the Lord gives revelation sometimes, how he quickens that. I've not been, I've not been a big dreamer through the years. But I think it was back in 1980, when was it? It was, I think it was 19, well, gosh, I've forgotten when. I'm I'm too old to remember when things happen. It's like gone. (laughs) Many years ago, John Paul Jackson prophesied over me that I would be a prolific dreamer of dreams. Now all of a sudden in the last two days I've had three and I know that they're all significant for the kingdom. And I'm going to give you just a piece of just one because it quickens something in my heart that's a revelation we need to get hold of. And in this dream what happened was that we as a church owned a large building. I mean it was beautiful. Great big place bright, shiny, gorgeous, big place. But even though it was ours, we had never occupied it. We had never moved in. I mean, it was full of soft, comfy chairs and all kinds of... But we had never moved in. It had been used by another congregation all this time. Now all of a sudden, we were finally moving in to occupy what had been ours all along. We owned it, but we had not occupied it. And it was huge. Now there was more to the dream, and I'm going to leave the rest of it out, but it prompted something in me. It was kind of a a heart-level revelation that becomes a foundation for hope for everybody sitting here. And if you don't come out of here today with some burden lifted, and you don't come out of here today with your hope renewed, and your courage strengthened, I will have failed today. Here's the principle. God makes promises to us. Those promises reflect his will. When he makes a promise, because his word always accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent, you know, how many of you know it was by speaking he created the earth? He called it out with his word, When he speaks, a reality is established. That promise that he makes to us when he speaks becomes ours. We own it. It's reserved for us. Sometimes it's held in trust for us. It's established somewhere on God's timeline. And it's as real to him as us sitting here right now today in this place waiting for us to move into it at the appropriate time, according to our ability to walk in it. Now, lots of you, I want to clear some things up before they get twisted. Lots of you have camped on John 11, verse 24. It reads like this. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Too many people have taken that as license to go around confessing that things are real in the present that are not real in the present. You see what I'm saying? And they end up looking like idiots. It's like, I have cancer, but I know that I'm healed, so I'm confessing that I'm healed. Well, then why are you still on the chemo? Because you still have cancer. It's as though... You know, if we said it, if we confessed what was not real as if it were real, and we just said it with our mouths that somehow we could make it real. But people that have said that, I've watched it, they they weren't healed. Or they'll say, 
I'm blind in one eye, but I know I've been healed, and so I'm confessing that I can see, as if that confessing it would make it happen. Jesus never did that. Never told anybody to confess a healing that had not manifested in reality. You following me so far? In fact, I want you to watch this. This is Mark 8, 22. I'm kind of belaboring this point because there's a lot of confusion around it before I give you what I'm really saying, okay? Mark 8, verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes, now there's a method, and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. So he's not completely healed. Jesus didn't tell him, now go home and confess that you're healed and make it happen. It isn't what he did. What Jesus did was he recognized that the healing was incomplete and then he went back to work to finish the job. So here's the next verse. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. There's a balancing passage all about believing that you have received. I think it's a balancing passage to that one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, John says this. This is the confidence which we have before him. Here's, here's the condition. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So now whatever I ask that is according to his will, his will, not mine, then I can believe that I already have it. Catch that? If it's according to his will, then something is established that's real, and it's mine. So far, so good. But I've prayed a whole lot of things that I knew were his will, and I didn't get them right away, and some of them I still don't have. Anybody in that boat? Tell the truth. Some of the rest of you just now lied. <laughs> so you say, what's up with that? You know, did God lie? Well, no, God can't lie. Scripture speaks a lot about inheritance. Here's an illustration. And that's probably a good illustration. I already own a portion of my earthly father's estate. There are six of us. I already own one-sixth of it. It's laid up for me, but I have not yet received it because my father is still alive. I won't receive it until he dies. There's a waiting until the proper time. The principle of I own it, but I don't yet possess it is something like that. Ephesians chapter 1, 13, 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So our inheritance is established on God's timeline, right? We own it. It's ours. But we don't get it all right now. We have Holy Spirit. He's a down payment. He's the guarantee that the rest of it is coming. But we're not ready for the rest of it. It hasn't been granted to us yet. We don't have the fullness the promise becomes a reality that we own the moment the Lord speaks it. We have it, but we haven't yet occupied it. And so it's held in trust for us against the time that we can occupy it. <coughs> so when we pray according to the Lord's will, listen carefully. When we pray according to the Lord's will, he responds, and it becomes a reality Something we own, it's ours, but we may not yet have occupied it for a whole variety of reasons. What would you do? Think about this. Think about this in terms of what we have as an inheritance, but we have not occupied. Not yet, anyway. <clears throat> what would you do if you asked for the fullness of the inheritance, all the power that the Lord has promised, right now, and God gave it? Could you deal with it? Think about that. One of my favorite movies is Bruce Almighty. God give you that kind of power, you'd be, you'd be parting your tomato soup. You would. 
Give your spouse supernatural orgasms. That was in the movie. Part the cars on the freeway. Beep, yeah. You would. Yeah, let everybody win the lottery. Everybody gets a quarter. <laughs> See, there comes an appropriate time for the possession of the inheritance that's already ours. Check the promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you shall be a blessing. So there's a land reserved for Abraham's descendants and for Abraham, right? A couple of verses later, he's shown the land of Canaan. Verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. That's now a reality. God spoke it. It's the truth. That's their land. You follow me? But what follows is Abraham's son Isaac is born, and then Jacob is born to Isaac, and to Jacob the 12 patriarchs who are the leaders of the 12 tribes are born, and then they spend 400 years in slavery in Egypt. They're not in the land. Promise is delayed. It's their land, but they, don't, they haven't gotten to occupy it. Time's not right. It isn't happening. Fullness hadn't yet come. The land was always theirs. God promised it. But when the time came, listen to me now, when the time came to occupy it, it took some real effort. It took some risk. Go in and take the land. Oh, well, we can't. It's full of giants. I'll be with you. No, we can't. So they spend 40 years in the wilderness. The point is, God would be with them, but God wouldn't do it for them. God will be with you to occupy your land, but he won't do it for you. See, it could only happen for the Israelites when they picked up their faith and then picked up their swords and exerted themselves and went to war to take what was already theirs, even though they couldn't see in the natural how it could happen because there were giants in the land. Same giants in the land 40 years later as there were the first time. 40 years earlier, the whole nation fell into depression over the obstacles and the giants, and they failed to act. How many of us, how many of us have looked at the obstacles and we've looked at the problems that are coming up and we've looked at the troubles that are coming up and the hurts and the crises and the wounds and we fell into depression and we grumbled at God and we questioned him and wondered whether he loved us and then we failed to act and we retreated. And when we retreated, we failed to possess what God had already decreed and made real. Forty years later, people of Israel, now they're ready. And they began to act. And God was with them. The promise of God was real. The land was already theirs. And so God went before them to clear out the people of the land and enable them to occupy what had been theirs for hundreds of years. 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, listen, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You already own it, but you haven't occupied it but it's reserved for you, and that's our living hope. That's what draws us forward. Salvation, already yours. It's real. There's a destiny laid up for you in real terms where you and I live right now. There's a solution to your life. There's a solution to your obstacles already established by our Father who loves you. We own it. You own it. But we've got to occupy. 
Sometimes that means picking up a sword and going to war when you don't think you can. Another one of my favorite scenes in movies when Gandalf says to King Theoden, after the spirit of Saruman's been cast out of him, he says to him, perhaps your fingers would remember their strength if you grasped your sword once more. Oh, 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 oh. I'm serious. Perhaps you'd remember your strength if you picked up your sword once more. So across the pages of Scripture, Paul wrote things like this. I have been saved, I'm being saved, and I long for my salvation. (laughs) You know, it's done, it's happening, and it's yet to happen. Why? Because we own it, but we haven't occupied all of it yet. (laughs) Paul was moving into what was already his. 1973, personal story. I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree. Beth and I got married the year before. And um, that summer, after I graduated, God told us to get pregnant. He clearly called me to ministry. So I knew I had to go to three years of seminary, which is graduate school. And... um, Expensive graduate school. I was in Idaho. Seminary was in Southern California. I had no money. My wife's pregnant. I can't pay for school. How are we going to live? Woe is me. I can't afford it. I can do nothing. God doesn't love me, right? That's the way it goes. But if God called me to professional ministry and wanted me to get an education to do that, then that's the promise. And that means that it's real. It's established. I haven't occupied it, but it's there. It's it's mine. (coughs) And on that basis, I can ask and believe that I've received it because he called for it. It's his will. I don't have to confess for it to make it happen. Matter of fact, What I'm about to tell you, God did for me while I was negatively confessing every day. Thank God he didn't give me that much power to turn him aside. Dear God, to hear some people talk, you'd think it all depended on you. (laughs) What came out, you know, you're speaking negativity, nothing good going to happen to you because our words create things. No, our words don't create things. God's words create things. My words aren't big enough to turn his love and power aside. Understand? That's the father we serve. Anything else is legalism and religion. And I'm done with that. So I don't have to confess to make it happen. I don't even have to generate a lot of emotional, I believe, certainty. Right? I just have to pick up my sword and go occupy what God's already established for me, and it's okay if I'm grumbling and being afraid all along the way, as long as I go do it. And so here's the story. I got a full-ride scholarship to seminary a month and a half after they had closed the financial aid off, telling me it was all gone. I got a full ride. I was only supposed to have it that grant one year. I had it all three. All I had to do was step into it. We had just enough money to get to Southern California. So we get to Southern California, we get an apartment near the seminary in a complex, apartment complex that was for adults only when they knew that Beth was pregnant. Let us in anyway. Beth got a job when the company she went to work for knew she'd have to quit when the baby was born, and they hired her anyway. It was one miracle after another. It was a, listen, it was a path already prepared for us by God. When we believed emotionally and when we didn't, and all we had to do was pick up our sword and occupy. Just move into what he'd already reserved for us. See, failure to obey gets you nothing. Nothing. Takes you nowhere. And then no fair blaming God when that happens. God had told us 
to get pregnant before we left Idaho. Had no money. We had no insurance. But remember the promise, God is real. You own it before you realize it. Doing what you, you know, God said, wanted us to get pregnant. Well, okay, that part was easy. And a lot of fun. The part that was hard, the part that was hard was losing the birth control pills. That was, that was the, the, the fearful decision. How many of you know God's going to rearrange your plans? Beth and I were, <laughs> I had one year of college left. We were going to, we were going to get married. We knew that, but we thought, okay, we'll get married in five years because then I'll be done with seminary and established and that school, that's, that's logical. And then we discovered, that was March 1972. So then we discovered that it's better to marry than to burn. And we got married the following August 1972. And then we thought, okay, we won't have any kids till I get out of seminary. And God said, I don't think so. And so the summer before we left, she gets pregnant. No insurance, no money. How are we going to pay for this baby? Well, the OBGYN that, de- <laughs> that delivered charity delivered her for free. Best stepfather, who hated my guts, died just in time. <laughs> Yeah, that was there. There are spooks in the house. No, he hated my guts. He died just in time to will to Beth exactly what we needed to pay the bill for the baby to the dollar. Not even anything left over. It was perfect. See, you getting this? Here's what I'm telling you. The promised land is yours. You own it. But if you don't move to occupy it, even in the face of your fear, you never get there. If you obey your fears like the gang of slaves just out of Egypt, you're going to end up dying in the wilderness and the inheritance passes to someone else. It's not about what you feel. It's about what you choose. It's about where you put yourself. So you can live in a poverty spirit and you can choose to sit it out rather than respond to God's call, or you can begin to move forward and watch God's miracles unfold because they're already established. They're already yours. He already spoke them. Here's a simpler story. Some weeks ago, the local TBN station here in town, um, actually some months ago, they began asking me to host programs again with them. And so when I got there, the station manager says, You're, you know, you, you got a prophetic voice in, in this city. People need to hear it. Um, we really need your sermons. And they were making me preach in, front, in this studio in front of this, this glass eye. With the, my audience was the producer, you know, and so I, it was like awful, you know. And, he sa- and I said, well, you know, we videotape our sermons. Can't we bring those, you know, here? And he said, I can't use single camera Productions. I have to have multi-camera productions. I thought, oh dear God, that's two or three thousand dollars to get set up for. What do I, I don't. Immediately, my poverty spirit kicks in. I don't have that kind of money. But I began to pray. I put out an appeal on Facebook of all places. Somebody saw it and sent us the money. Ta-da! And so we got some of the equipment. You'll see it sitting back there. We bought two cameras and I found out I needed a third, and so I went to eBay, I love eBay, eBay's fun, went to eBay looking for a camera to match the two that we have. Well, that camera, even used, ranges in price from about $375 up to $450 used. And so I go on eBay, and really, I'm telling you about how you take the land, how it's already prepared for you. So I go on eBay, and I find a factory refurbished camera to match the ones that we have. And the opening bid stated by the seller is $225. And so I bid $225. And it's the first time in all my years of dealing with eBay that no one else placed a bid. Right? And I thought, well, that could have been a fluke. Well, there was another piece of equipment that I needed. 
A lot of you won't know what an audio compressor is, but I needed that in order to, to get this started next week. We're going to start live. Actually, here's the deal. We're going to start live streaming next week over the Internet because there are a lot of people that relate to us around the country. They watch our sermons. They get fed by them, and they've been asking me, can we get worship? Can we get the worship on this? And I thought, well, you know, we could live stream the whole service. And there are a lot of there, there, there are older people at home who love us, but they can't get here. And so we can live stream to them. So I needed one other piece of equipment, an audio compressor, to do this. Well, the one that I thought we could use cost about $120 new, so I went on eBay. <laughs> and there I found the opening bid on one of those compressors was $25 and shipping. And so I bid $25, and for the second time in a row, nobody else placed a bid. And so I got a $120 compressor for $25 and shipping. Here's what I'm telling you. All of that, because of what God had called us to do, was already established in God. And all we had to do was pick up the sword and move into it. See, so... I guess I'm saying, you know, if, if, if I'd been stuck in a poverty spirit, none of that would have happened. If I'd failed to move, none of that would have come together. And it's the same for everybody sitting in this room. If you don't move, you don't occupy what God has already made real for you. The Israelites own that land. I have given it to you. Said it to Joshua on the border of the promised land. I've given this land to you. What if, he, what if he had stayed on the far side of the Jordan River and said, we're just a bunch of nomads. They're all living in houses. There are giants in there. And we don't have the military force to take it. There would have been no Bible. There would have been, there would, I'd, I, there would have been any King David there wouldn't have been a Jesus who descended from... you follow me? See, this is... You plant this in your heart, there's going to be some hope. I believe on the basis... Here's just another piece. I, on, on the basis of multiple prophetic words I've received over the years, I believe that God has a new building for this church. It's going to enable us to expand our ministries to people. Because right now we're choked off in a whole number of places, starting with the parking lot and proceeding to warehouse space for all the people we feed. We don't have the space. And it cuts off a lot of what God wants to do. I believe, that, I mean, and it's been prophesied again and again. So what I believe is this. Like the promised land for the Israelites, that building is established and it's real on God's timeline. He's already there. We already own it. I'm not denying that we're still stuck in this building. You're not going to catch me confessing that this building is new and I love it so. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm really honest with God. I hate this place. Every time I go to the bathroom and look at the bathroom, I hate this place. Every time I go to the youth room, I want to go and take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> You guys aren't dirty. It's just the way it is, you know. So. I mean, guys, we have bathrooms in the youth room, in the youth room that look like a rundown gas station 70 miles out of Reno, Nevada. I mean, that's how the, it's, I hate this building. So, I'm not confessing positively about this building, but I know that wherever we're going is already established. We already own it. We just haven't occupied it yet. And I know that when, that, that, that when it's time to occupy it, it's not going to be easy. Any more than it was easy for Israel to pick up their swords and go to war. There's going to be risk involved. And some of that risk is going to get personal for us to move into a destiny that we have as a people. One of our members recently 
had been stuck in a job that was demanding so much of her and sucking so much out of her for so little pay it was wrecking her ministry and her health. She prayed for what would be the ideal job, the job of her dreams. I knew it was what God wanted. It was there already hers reserved for her, but it took time and it took readiness. And that job came to pass just recently with a huge learning curve attached. Poverty spirit would turn to fear and trash that opportunity like the Israelites who first rejected the promise, turned away because of the giants. But that's not what this sister in the Lord's doing. She's walking. She, <laughs> the sword is out. She's walking in. She had that job from the first day she asked for it because it was already in God's heart. It was already in God's will. It just took time to occupy. See, possession of the land takes effort. It takes character change. It means we have to have to act even in the face of fear, but there's a certainty of hope attached to it. If God promised it, it's real. And if it's real, then we move to occupy. And if there's waiting involved, then we look for a character change while the waiting's going on. And if the waiting is over, then we pack up our tents and we pick up our swords and we move in. Right now, I am losing count of how many of our people are in the hospital or battling serious injury or illness. It's crazy. If I decided to go visit every one of them, it would take me two days right now. There are so many. What do we do with that? You know, we've seen serious healings here. I mean, really miraculous healings. My, My favorite My favorite is the baby a few months ago that that was healed of Down syndrome in the womb. I mean, that's my favorite. These things have happened. We know that God does that. Mark 16, 18 says that those who believe would lay hands on the sick and they'd recover. But we don't see that happen as often as we like, do we? I mean, not nearly. I've got a list. I want to see more. So there are giants in the land, aren't there? And we could, we could give up in depression and in discouragement and, and quit praying for people. Are we going to do that or are we going to pick up our swords and act? I'm going to pick up my sword and I'm going to act. And I'm going to keep acting and we're going to keep acting. We're going to keep moving forward faithfully knowing that if God promised it, we already own it and we're called to occupy. See, It's not God that we have to get him to move. He's already moved. It's us that need to move. When Jesus said, John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Now, if if we read that, and we don't see what we want to see, do we give up and settle for something less? And then call that the norm. Do we let the giants in the land turn us aside? Or do we realize that every, promises, that every promise of God establishes an unchangeable reality? Yeah, there are obstacles. Yes, there are giants to overcome. But God is with us to overcome them. Here's another piece of it. Psalm 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He didn't say that there wouldn't be obstacles to overcome, did he? That's not a part of the bargain. He didn't say it would be easy. He didn't say we'd never get sick. He didn't say we'd never have another financial problem. He didn't say you'd never have another fight with your spouse. He didn't say there'd never be an accident or an injury. He didn't say you'd never be unemployed. He didn't say your parents wouldn't kick you out of the house. In fact, he said there would be lots of problems. You did catch that. (laughs) He said there'd be lots of afflictions. He said there'd be lots of hurts. He said there'd certainly be betrayals. There'd certainly be failures. There'd certainly be mistakes made. There'd certainly be illnesses and injuries, and there'll certainly be griefs. But when God says he delivers them out of them all, that means the outcome, the solution, is already ours. How many times does he have to deliver us from a tough situation before we get it? Serious. 
How many Red Seas does Israel have to pass through before they understand that God can take care of the next one? We have short memories, don't we? It's crazy. We already own it. We just have to move into it. Pick up your sword. Move out in faith. Stop looking at the giants. Stop looking at the hurts and the discouragements and the obstacles. Stop thinking about giving up or quitting. God's in us. He's in this. <coughs> God had this church, this place of promise, on his timeline 21 years ago this month. I was in a bad place back then. I was more defeated than I've ever been in my life. The whole world was arrayed against me. God was calling for this church to be birthed, but there were giants in this land and I was weaker than I've ever been in my life. I thought I had led my family into a dead end. I had no idea how I was going to go forward. I didn't want to be in Denver. I wanted out of town. And then the prophetic words began to come. Too many to ignore. God's promise was coming to me. And it was real. And it was mine. And I could own it if I chose. Like Israel in the promised land, I could look at the giants and refuse to move. But if I did, there'd be a wilderness to follow worse than the one I'd already been in. Well, the rest of the story is that it's already yours. It was already mine. Some of you know pieces of this story, but I, the last week that I was on staff at the other church, I had a conference in Vermont and while I was there, I asked some top leaders who were speaking alongside me in the charismatic renewal, asked them to pray, and the Lord began to hatch a plan. And uh, I said, Lord, if this plan is really yours, I need three months' income up front at the rate that I've been paid. And by the time that w people, we didn't tell the people, the people in the conference just said, you know, we feel led to give money to Lauren and Beth. And by the end of that week, we had one and a half times three months income, which gave us what we needed to buy the first sound system for the church and get it moving. See, it was already established on God's timeline. I just had to step into it. And the same's true for you. A lot of you have sensed that something awesome is about to happen in this place. And that means it's going to happen to you. To you. And that's because it's real. Because God spoke it. And because God spoke it, it's established. What we've asked for, we've already received because God willed it. We just need to keep pressing forward into it. Is that an amen? Now, if you don't go out of here, <laughs> if you don't go out of here feeling strengthened today, then you probably weren't listening. If you don't go out of here feeling a renewed sense of hope, then you probably had a closed heart. But I'm not looking at closed hearts. Okay? Father, I pray you seal this up for us. Make it real. Lord, I pray that you break down strongholds today in the hearts strongholds of discouragement and, and failure and fear that have been built up over a period of time and that you inject instead your spirit and your vision and your hope and the knowledge that because you are Lord and you, you transcend time that you're already there in the solution. You're already there in the destiny. You're already there in the future. Lord, help us to move into it. Help us to occupy what you've already decreed for us. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.